अनम्यूट करना है अनम्यूट करना है उन्होंने बताना लाइव करने से पहले ना कि हम लाइव करने लगे हैं और उनकी प्रेजेंटेशन डॉक्टर नीलम की रख दी है वहां पे प्रेजेंटेशन अभी नहीं आई उसे के फिर एक ही दफा अब कितने पे लाइव करना है 130 पे मैंने अभी लाइव कर दिए ये जो मैंने ये जो की है अच्छा वो लाइव अच्छा फिर आप यहां ना बोले आवाजें भी जा रही होंगी यहां से म्यूट कर दें दूसरी तरफ से
Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Assalamualaikum. So we'll be starting the, our breast cancer webinar today in times of coronavirus. So uh, I have uh, a couple of uh, other oncologists with me as speakers. So I think I'll start first with just uh, you know giving an overview of breast cancer management recommendations during the the current pandemic. So this is just today's figures from Pakistan. As you can see that we now have the peak. And uh, the, this morning the figures reported that we crossed the one lakh uh, numbers. And uh, more than 2,000 deaths have been reported. And 24 hours uh, figures are the four. 1,646 cases reported. Uh, and this graph just briefly tells you that a lot more the blue ones are males. A lot more males are affected than females, but across all ages, females are also uh, positive for COVID. And this is actually quite a dramatic graph. It tells you that in April 2020, you know, we were very low figures and up to now it's really it's risen here and which is you know like quite a striking increase in the number of COVID cases. So coming to breast cancer in normal circumstances also we know that it's a very integrated and multidisciplinary approach and intervention in one specialty has a direct impact on the other specialty. And we need to be discussing every case and tumor modes, which we do try to. But nowadays, it is recommended that not only do we discuss our, the diagnosis and everything, we need to have special COVID-19 recommendations because obviously, because it depends on the resources of the place where patient is uh, going to get therapy as well as where we are in the pandemic and if the, how much is the risk of uh, the coronavirus. And then we must document all these discussions in the medical record of the patient. This is highly recommended. So as we discussed, if some, some of you might have seen our uh, oncology webinar last week, that for all cancer, we need to give them a priority classification. So that tells us that how to approach these patients. In breast cancer, uh, internationally agreed are certain uh, priorities which are developed across all the discipline. And based on severity of the disease, comorbidities and potential efficacy of treatments, I'll be talking more about medical oncology aspects. And priority A is that patients who have uh, immediately life-threatening disease, spinically unstable, and even if we delay for a short period, it will have a huge impact on the patient's prognosis. So, and treating them has a huge impact on their survival, benefits of survival, or it could be, you know, like a significant improvement in patient's quality of life. Category B are like medium risk, and most of the breast cancer patients will fall under priority B. That means that you know we need to start therapy. It's not urgent, but we need to start usually within six weeks uh, because a short delay will not have an, uh, an impact. But delaying further than six to twelve weeks because in category B also there are further categories. B1 is high priority. Start therapy as soon as possible. B2 is mid-level and B3 is low priority. So for the high and medium priority, these are all patients who come with newly diagnosed uh, invasive breast cancer. And we make decisions based on biology and state like we do in uh, pre-pandemic uh, circumstances. Then patients who are on treatment and then they develop new symptoms suggestive of prognosis or progression. So these are also high priority. Patients who are completing new adjuvant therapy, surgery, and are being planned for radiation. Priority C are mostly patients who have had the therapy and they're on follow up. And, you know, if they work up and everything, we can defer it 
till the pandemic is over. So it's not urgent. And these are patients who are coming to a follow up clinic for survivorship, patients who are high risk of relapse, patients who are back up carriers. So these are category C that we can delay their appointments and defer most of the management till the pandemic is over. Then even in category C are the screening examinations. So patients like these days, I'm just coming from my clinic, where many of the patients have breast cancer. So I think it's quite safe to delay uh, mammography, ultrasound, MRI screening uh, uh, modalities that till the pandemic is over, unless you know it's a high risk patient, somebody young, like a carrier, you might want to do it um, earlier on. So uh, out of the high priority, we can categorize them into early breast cancer and metastatic because early is potentially killed. And uh, the most high risk we know is triple negative breast cancer and her to uh, positive breast cancer. So these patients need to have the new adjuvant and adjuvant chemotherapy and uh, in her to positive targeted. Those ER positive or high risk like multi electron positive and they need therapy. So because they will be categorized as high risk category A, so they need to start the new adjuvant either chemotherapy or depending, you might even want to start endocrine. Triple negative is more or less the same way you would approach, but you could change the schedule and increase the interval between the chemotherapy cycles. HER2 positive again, standard of care, more or less the same therapy. However, you can individualize. If you have a patient who has a small tumor, lymph node negative, ER positive, and no other risk factors, then you could uh, give them just paclitaxel and trastuzumab. Uh, which is, you know, like the evidence based and uh, is uh, effective. Also, uh, try to switch. Uh, it is recommended that IV should be switched to subcutaneous because our aim is really to minimize patient visit to the hospital because not only to protect them from coronavirus as well as to, you know, like uh, conserve our resources and to our, also safeguard our health personnel. So the less number of patients visiting the hospital is what we are wanting to do these days. And if you have subcutaneous trastuzumab, you can even arrange it for the patient to have it at home if it's somebody you know, who's educating and her to positive again, apart from changing their, uh, you know, like giving subcutaneous and giving a different chemo protocol, in stage one and two, you could even give uh, TDM1 adding uh, pertuzumab uh, in new adjuvant adjuvant setting. So you're trying to avoid chemotherapy, especially in elderly patients who have comorbids, uh, because as we know that chemotherapy is, uh, chemotherapy is immune uh, suppressive. So the other thing is that if a patient is on adjuvant trastuzumab, and usually we give it three weekly, but in this setting, you may want to delay to six to eight weeks and then start. So by that time, you would, you know, like maybe the peak would be over and less chances of getting corona. Also now, uh, yeah, these are, you know, like what I'm telling you, these are recommendations from different groups, different breast cancer consortiums, uh, NCCN, ESMO, ESCO, everything, you know, like I try to get, go through all of those. So, uh, there is a consensus that in some patients, especially elderly and who are very high risk of getting COVID complications, you could cut down the adjuvant trastuzumab to six months instead of completing the one. Then uh, other high priority are the patients who already were on therapy and then this pandemic started. So just continue with that. Uh, and for example, if you have a triple negative breast cancer patient and the patient is taking capecitabine, then complete these cycles. And those patients who are high risk, HER2, and they're receiving TDM1 in the adjuvant setting, they need to just continue those. Then ER positive, HER2 negative tumor. These are, you know, like endocrine positive. If they are stage one or stage two and N1 more involvement, a low to intermediate grade, lobular, and the genomic assay, if you are able to do it, is low. Luminal A type, then it is felt that we can safely 
you know, like defer their surgery, start new adjuvant endocrine therapy, which can be given from six to 12 months, but just make sure that, you know, like you're monitoring the patient via the teleclinic and uh, just to make sure that there's no progression. And best is really to ask the patient, they will tell you if the tumor is uh, not going down or it's getting bigger. So monitoring is very important. Then we come to the low priority. So the first ones were you know, like the ones early stage and they need therapy. Low priority are the ones who are follow up imaging, restaging. You have patient who needs to have scans. You can defer these. Echocardiogram, if the patient is clinically well, uh, it's agreed that you could defer that. ECGs, bone density scan. So cut down on the number of investigations. And especially in patients who are clinically well and there are no signs of uh, progression. Then sequencing also be changed instead of following the you know, visual, uh, we tend to do radiation at the end. In some patients ER positive, you could give radiation you know, earlier on in the sequence of Coming to chemotherapy, chemotherapy, like, again, we have to like, take into account toxicity and combinations and we could play around with the drug. And you know, combining anthracyclinic toxins is not advisable because it's quite toxic. So give it in sequence rather than combinations. FEC type regimens where you have three drugs again, you know, you are more likely to have more problems, neutropenia, and also uh, GCSF is strongly recommended. The threshold is like much more, lower than it used to be 20% risk of febrile neutropenia. Even if it's 10% risk, JCSF is recommended. Chemotherapy, second generation, instead of AC, which is partly toxic, you're not able to monitor the heart. TC is a good alternative. However, remember that in TC, 60% patients develop neutropenia, so you have to always give GCSF. So that was all early stage breast cancer, and with curative intent, coming to metastatic breast cancer. So in metastatic, we can be more liberal. We can, you know, change the dose and schedule according to the patient's requirement as well as, you know, feasibility of uh, giving them therapy. So definitely we should try to cut down the, on the clinic visits, cut down on the blood works. I feel sometimes we do too many blood tests. So we need to definitely cut it down. Then also cut down on the therapies which are going to give more side effects. So you want the patient to stay at home with minimum symptoms at the same time getting therapy so the disease is under control. And those patients who don't have signs and symptoms no need to do too many scans. And, uh, you know, just clinical follow-up should be enough for them. And if you think that the palliative chemotherapy uh, has a very small benefit then and risk of treatment with chemotherapy and bringing the patient to chemo bay. Those who are very high risk of morbidity with coronavirus, uh, you know, like it suggested, then it may be just hold chemotherapy and you know, consider your goals of therapy always. Triple negative breast cancer instead of chemotherapy, PDL1 positive metastatic setting, immunotherapy could be considered, but monitor for neuronitis. Metastatic uh, triple negative if the patient is back or positive, PARP inhibitor is a good uh, therapy. However, keep in mind that the, it also causes myelosuppression. Patients can get neutropenia and can get infections. So we have to be cautious that it's oral. So and if we have a HER2 positive, again, you could just give trastuzumab, pertuzumab, or TDM1, and give it even the frequency can, you know, like the space between two cycles you get increased. Pertuzumab within six weeks if you get you're pretty safe. And if a patient with metastatic cancer has been well for two years and you've been giving targeted therapies and there's minimal disease burden, then you could maybe just hold the transduzumab, let the patient stay at home and see her after two to three months or if the patient develops symptom. So a lot of changes you can make um, if you keep in mind that these are not normal days, these are, you know, like we are, everybody's in high alert, all hospitals are, so we need to minimize patient, uh, patient visit to the hospital. Also, you can, you know, like pertuzumab and taxins when you are partnering, you need to remember that what is the side effect of the C-taxin, 
more neutropenia if you could give it three weekly about so gcs said you have to give you give a lot more steroids with docetaxel if you give paclitaxel weekly more visits but more better tolerated and you know you can taper the dexamethasone pre medication also you can make changes according to the patient's requirement and also cut down on the blood test so, as i said before that we do if a patient is stable and previous bloods have been normal you could just be those patients who are her to positive but endocrine positive we do have the option that and if they have low volume disease that instead of chemotherapy partner the trastuzumab with endocrine therapy for example you could combine letrozole and receptin you could combine fenestran and receptin and the patient will that way you know like mostly stay at home less immunosuppression and uh, better tolerance again in metastatic setting Uh, single agent chemotherapy is preferred. Scheduling, you know, you could think about paclitaxel toxicity, which is every four weeks, and uh, paclitaxel can be albumin bound abrexin, which is uh, again, you know, more better tolerated. And if it's low burden of disease, you could even delay chemotherapy, just wait and you know, get chemotherapy later. So as I said, oral chemotherapy is better. Oral you can give for two, three cycles if the patient is able to understand, rather than coming back for every three weeks and manage them via telemedicine. So uh, you know, I, I would strongly urge that we need to aim to offer our patient best home-based supportive care. Try to keep the patient at home, and if they are able to get. In some people, I mean, giving chemotherapy, I would be reluctant because I think it's not that easy here. But that's one thought: if somebody is able to do that, if you have oncology trained nurse and a setup, but usually no. But home infusion for supportive care, definitely we should use it more rather than calling them for hydration, transfusions, antibiotics. If the patient can have it at home, that would be much better. And switching to subcutaneous injections, as I said earlier. Supported GCS, erythropoietin, IV, iron infusion instead of transfusion. Steroids we should try to cut down. We use a lot of steroids for chemotherapy, pre-med, antimetic. I think we need to cut down, or if we have to give, give lower doses. Then ER positive metastatic breast cancer. We all familiar with the endocrine therapies. LHR agnus could be every three months. Again, very useful. Colvestrin in terms of so. Coming to CDK 4-6 inhibitors, yes, they are very useful and um, survival benefit by addition. However, we need to remember that patients can get neutropenia, so closely monitor. Uh, although febrile neutropenia is not often reported, valvocyclic may be better, uh, but if it's available, because uh, you can actually reduce the dose. In the other two, ribo and epistemoxyclic, you can't really reduce the dose. It's not recommended. And if the patient is just bone only disease, low burden, then you don't have to start CDK 46 these days. Just start with AI, and you know, see the patient after three months, and if at that time uh, circumstances are better, then you can add to uh, CDK 46. Mtor inhibitors, exemestin is not recommended. Mtor is exemestin you can give because of the risk of pneumonitis in up to 50 percent patients. I had a patient landing in ICU. So you have to be very careful during pandemic. We have to avoid that because of the increased risk of death, especially if the patient gets COVID. Clinics are mostly teleclinics, strongly encouraged, and in persons we should not be doing. But if at all, for example, our new patients, if we're doing in-person visit, then we have to take a lot of uh, precautions, make sure that the risk is to both the patient. As well as to uh, to the doctors and nurses. Post-treatment surveillance again, it can be deferred. I think we should cut down on the follow-up clinics and really delay them if the patients are well. So essentially, most important thing to remember in patient with breast cancer or any cancer that ready availability of information that is the key. We have to keep on informing the patient. We need to be well informed. About the recent most guidelines, and 
communicate. We have to communicate with our patients and uh, amongst our colleagues and getting to know the re recent you know, like, uh, recommendations. And also we need to be able to have a lot of hotlines so that patients instead of traveling, they can call and uh, we can sort out a lot of things. Uh, so essentially, you know, like coming to the end, I think we none of us uh, has seen anything like that in our lifetime. It is unprecedented. And these are difficult and distressing decisions. So we need to, you know, like make sure that we uh, stay together and we support each other. And uh, it's crucial that we have advanced life care plans for our patients, goals of care we need to de decide right in the beginning and discuss with the patient, discuss amongst ourselves, and we need to document it. So with that, I'll end my talk. And I am uh, one of the radiation oncologists uh, that is treating breast cancer in Shokat Khanam Cancer Hospital uh, from the last 20 25 years. Uh, in the present uh, circumstances with COVID 19 pandemic all over the world, things have become very difficult for both for patients and for the on oncologists how to deal with concurrent concomitant like a current cancer treatment plus uh, preventing yourself from the risk of uh, COVID uh, coronavirus infection. So uh, in these circumstances, uh, when the country has uh, or the government has instructions for lockdown in different cities, uh, the transport coming from different areas is restricted the nearby uh, accommodation for the patients around the hospital is closed. Uh, the hospital, um, uh, hostel type place where uh, in, in Shokat Khanam, where most of our uh, indigent patients used to stay for radiotherapy for three to four weeks <clears throat> has been closed down uh, during the pandemic. So it's a, it was a big problem. For patients, because we we are is a tertiary center, so patients were coming from all over Pakistan, from right from KPK remote areas, from Sin, from Punjab, different areas, and most of them had to stay because radiation is not just given every three weekly or two weekly or weekly like chemotherapy; it has to be given daily. So this was a big issues. So considering all these issues of lockdown with transport, uh, accommodation, uh, we had and preventing the patients from exposure to infection, we had to make, to make certain decisions regarding uh, what to do, uh, how to cope with the situation. So in, in, the, in these circumstances, we uh, had to decide either to or make radiation or to 
delay radiation or to give radiation where it's important in minimum fractions, which is called hypo fractionation or accelerated radiation. So in certain patients, uh, we had to make a decision which patients are we, we can omit radiotherapy, would though in the initial stages or in, in treatment boards it were decided to give them radiation, but now in present circumstances, which are the patients that you would avoid and tell them not to come for radiotherapy. These would be women 70 plus with comorbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension. These are strongly ERPR positive women, uh, HERT negative, nodes negative. So you can easily omit radiotherapy in, 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 in this COVID-19 circumstances, though in normal circumstances, you could have given them radiotherapy just to give them even if there was a minimum advantage of radiotherapy, but still you, if their breast was safe, so you just to prevent a recurrence, you would give, but in present circumstances, exposing these high elderly women with comorbid conditions uh, to, co to uh, coronavirus infection would be more dangerous. Therefore, we would tell these women to stay at home and to continue their hormonal treatment and not to come for radiotherapy. So these are the women that one can avoid, uh, in which we could avoid radiotherapy. Then the, uh, there would be cases in which you could delay radiation. I mean, not every uh, uh, women uh, after the chemo and surgery should start radiotherapy within four to six weeks. Uh, studies have shown over the years that women who are ERPR positive, who has who has undergone new adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy and surgeries, that you could delay radiation very um, easily or without any risk for uh, from uh, 12 weeks to 16 weeks. So that means three to four months delay of radiotherapy can easily be started in these women who are ERPR positive, who have undergone surgeries, who, and who are, uh, who are whose margins are negative. So you can delay them instead of calling them for radiotherapy. In, in then there is a uh, women who are high risk. For example, women who have uh, uh, have a high number of nodes positive, they are ERPR negative. Their margins are closed. They are very young, less than 40 years of age, in which you think that radiation should be started within four to six to eight weeks of their last chemo or last surgery. So in these women, there are different uh, regimens or schemes that uh, we, we can follow in, in uh, radiation centers. Like in, uh, at one stage, we used to give 200 centigrade in 30 fractions that means six weeks stay in a nearby hospital or coming daily to the hospital for six weeks. But now the studies have shown that hyperfractionating regimens like giving them higher dose in less number of fractions are equally effective and would save would give them minimum stay uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the hospital or the number of fractions. Like for example, instead of giving 30 fractions, we have reduced it to 15 fractions. 267 gray per day in 15 fraction is as good as 200 centigrade in 30 fractions. So instead of six weeks, these women could stay only for three weeks. Um, with, with no com comparison has been made and there is no extra side effects of like one would think that if you are giving high dose of radiation in, um, in 15 uh, fractions rather than 230 fraction, you would get brisk skin, skin reactions or more fibrosis studies have shown that it's not the case and in, in fact the reactions are less as compared to 200 centigrade per day so this is one of the regimens that commonly we commonly follow here then in certain cases the women say or they, they can't stay for 15 days uh, it's impossible for them and there is high risk of infection so in these women we are using um, short uh, more shorter regimens which is 26 gray altogether in five fractions, which is the, uh, the studies that has been done in the UK. Uh, this is known as uh, uh, fast forward uh, study and in, in which we give uh, five fractions or total 26 gray. 
so in five days, the women are gone home back easily. Then there are regimens in which you can give 10 grays. It depends on individual institutions. These are different protocols that can be adopted in COVID-19 cases. So then the, in, in certain cases, we used to give boost five extra fractions, like you give 15 fractions to the whole breast and five fractions to the cavity where the tumor was. So we, in these circumstances, we have to decide which women are most necessary to uh, that we should give boost. And is it necessary to give boost to all the women? No, it's not necessarily. If the margins are clear, if the if if new, after post uh, new adjunct chemotherapy surgeries have been done and there is no evidence of residual tumor, nodes are negative. She patient is ERPR positive. She is more than 50 years of age. You can easily avoid the boost last five fractions that we norm in normal circumstances that we give. So in, in, in this way, you can avoid five fractions or five days. Uh, you can reduce in their stay in the hospitals. Again, there will be certain women in which you think the boost is, is necessarily necessary because the margin is closed. Uh, post new adjunct chemotherapy, her nodes were positive and she is a high risk of local recurrence in these women then what we do is we can give concomitant boost, which means that during this 15 fractions, you just add your boost along with that instead of giving them boost at the end of the treatment. Or you can, what you can do is you can give a high dose, like in, in hyperfractionated fast forward trial, we can give a single boost of high, uh, high dose, 5.2 uh, gray in single fraction and instead of five fractions. So this also make their stay shorter. And uh, uh, so these different um, um, regimens that we uh, I've mentioned, you can adopt in COVID-19 cases. So three, uh, just to summarize what I've said is first you have to make decision which women it, it's important to give start radiation in which you can avoid radiation or you can forego the radiation that I've told you that elderly women ERP are positive with comorbid condition, but with low risk factor, you can tell them that, OK, we'll take a risk. We don't want to radiate you. We don't want to expose you to uh, coronavirus infection, which is more dangerous for you being elderly women with comorbid. Then second decision is which women that we can delay the radiation instead of totally avoiding it. And in, in, in that, I have also mentioned that these are the women who are ERPR positive, who had received new adjunct chemotherapy, who has received surgeries, their margins are clear, their nodes are negative. You can easily delay the radiation from 12 to 16 weeks, which is a good period of time. Hopefully in three to four months, maybe things get better. And then I mentioned that we can, in, in women with, where there is utmost need for radiotherapy, you can tailor your regimens to limited number of fractionations, hyperfractionation reg regimens. Then I have mentioned how to, is the boost necessary? If the boost is necessary, you can give it concomitantly with radiotherapy so that you avoid the last five fractions or five days, or you can give a single fraction, high dose to that cavity boost. So this is uh, what I have to, uh, what we we have done in, uh, in, in uh, this last couple of weeks, and I hope things get better uh, in future and we go back to our normal fractionations because uh, the fast forward trial and the hyperfractionation, these are new trials. America has not adopted it. It's only been adopted in UK. So there are still uh, limitations or uh, apprehensions among the radiation colleges because we don't have a long term data of uh, more than five years in these patients. Only three year data is available. We don't know what would be the long term complication by increasing the dose and limiting the number of options. Thank you so much.
जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम आई एम डॉक्टर मी कुलसो मवान कंसल्टेंट मेडिकल ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट एट शौकत खानम हॉस्पिटल एंड टुडे आई विल टॉक अबाउट हाउ डिड द कोविड-19 पेंडेमिक इंपैक्ट आवर ब्रेस्ट कैंसर सर्विस एंड व्हाट मेजर्स डिड वी टेक टू इंप्रूव आवर पेशेंट आउटकम दिस इज नॉट वर्किंग so as we all know that covid-19 pandemic poses uh, unprecedented challenges for patients clinicians and healthcare systems and across the globe all the clinicians they are trying to respond to this pandemic by modifying patient care in order to minimize the exposure risk as well as uh, manage the patients this is especially important in cancer patients because of the risk of rapid progression and the disease getting out of control so uh, at shaukat khanam we prioritized our cancer depending on the hospital resources uh, including the financial status as well as the manpower uh, level of our staff getting inflicted exposure of the patients to covid taking into account the personal uh, their personal comorbidities the uh, level of uh, cancer and their outcome as uh, related to this and weighing the risk of disease progression against the viral exposure to the patients so uh, the demand that this covid-19 puts on the health system on throughout the world is it cannot be predicted but we know for sure that it is going to be huge for low middle uh, middle income com countries like pakistan and hence we have to prioritize and set our goals uh, the hospital administration goals are to reduce the uh, to to conserve the hospital resources for virus infected patients as well as for the cancer patients and we at medical oncology we are trying to minimize the patient interaction and to maintain patient safety as well as providing them effective cancer care so we had to prioritize because the hospital resources and the staffing becomes more limited uh, with the increase in this covid-19 pandemic and it becomes critically important to define which patients need more urgent care and which are the ones who can be Uh, for which we can delay and we can wait for few uh, maybe uh, till the pandemic is over so we uh, as dr neelam has already described we prioritized our patient into three categories category a are the patients who uh, need and they, they have an immediately life threatening condition and they need urgent intervention so that their outcome can be improved Uh, and this included medical uh, oncology emergencies like febrile neutropenia uh, brain mass spot compression at shaukat khanam we have a 24 7 er service which is fully functional and all the patients they are assessed uh, initially in the camp covid uh, followed by their assessment in the er if the patients they are found negative for covid they are admitted on the routine wards where uh, the treatment as per the necessity is started if medical treatment is required uh, that is started and if they need radiotherapy uh, for cord compression or vein mass that is started however if some patient tests positive for covid uh, they are placed on a special covid uh, ward but all the treatment is started except for radiotherapy which is given at the end of the list so that once the patient is done with the radiotherapy courses uh, all the necessary disinfection according to the sops is done and the machines in the department is ready for the non covid patients most of our patients they fell in the priority b category and they are the ones who do not have life threatening emergencies but for whom we do not want to delay our treatment more than 12 weeks so these patients they included newly diagnosed breast cancer patients the patients who are already having iv chemotherapy the ones who had completed their chemotherapy but they are waiting for the surgery and the ones who have uh, had their chemotherapy and surgery and they are waiting for the uh, radiotherapy services so 
the third category is the C category, and that is the category we, where we had a sigh of relief because these are the patients where the treatment can be delayed for um, indefinitely and without adversely uh, impacting their uh, outcomes. So these patients, uh, we decided that we'll try to see them and monitor them uh, remotely and they are the ones who are coming for routine follow-ups, they are on the oral hormonal treatment or they are not on active treatment but they are on their survivorship visits. We can delay interventions for a few months without uh, having any undoubted effect. So for the patient um, in at Shotokhana, we have a dedicated breast MDT which happens every week and all the new patients they are discussed there and we make a personalized uh, treatment plan for every patient. Uh, usually we give uh, new agent chemotherapy or new agent treatment, but there are some patients who have early stage uh, favorable disease, which is small in size and there we send them for upfront surgery. However, during this pandemic, the theater services were shut down initially and now they are being gradually opened up and during that time, uh, all the patients were referred for new adjunct therapy, be it uh, a radiotherapy, and there were some patients for which we uh, offered endocrine therapy who had uh, small, uh, low risk stage one or stage two disease or who had lobular cancer or luminal A cancers. However, not all the patients uh, can be given hormonal therapy or radiotherapy. There are some patients who will definitely need uh, chemotherapy and they include triple negative breast cancer or all the cancer, uh, breast cancer patients who have already started on their new adjunct or adjunct chemotherapies. For them, we made a plan to uh, space out their treatment regime so that their uh, hospital visits and hence the risk of getting COVID uh, infection is reduced. So the dose dense chemotherapy which is given every two weeks we change it to three weeks uh, three weekly regimes and some of the three weekly regimes were uh, switched to four weekly uh, we do not give uh, um, filgrastim for every patient routinely and we usually recommend it for all those uh, regimes which have a higher chance of neutropenia more than 20 percent but these are unusual circumstances uh, so we are giving GCSF and a uh, huge amount of anti so that the patient do not have to come to the hospital. Uh, regarding anti her to new therapy, uh, we have uh, switched the trastuzumab administration to subcutaneous route so that their hospital uh, uh, visit is minimized and hence the risk of exposure is also reduced. For advanced stage cancers, uh, the routine staging for uh, non-symptomatic patients, we deferred them and for all the patients who were diagnosed with stage 4 disease but they had not started on their chemotherapy uh, when this pandemic started, uh, we deferred their treatment for three months and now with easing off of the lockdowns and uh, all the current measures, we are approaching our patients and all those who can come to the hospital, we are restaging them and are uh, offering them chemotherapy or whatever treatment they need. We are also giving CDK4 six inhibitors here. However, the numbers are not high and hence we have not changed the schedule as yet, and, but we are monitoring their side effects and further assessment via the teleclinics. Regarding the supportive care, endocrine therapy, uh, luteinizing hormone, releasing hormones are being given and they are very safe to be used in this pandemic. We are giving these uh, treatment to the patients on three monthly basis and home administration is also uh, encouraged. So the patient, as I've already mentioned, we are giving them GCSF and uh, antiemetics as well. Interventions that alleviate the severe symptoms like painkillers or are very much encouraged. However, the mo bone modifying agents like bisphosphonates are deferred uh, in patients who uh, do not have hypercalcemia, who are on adjuvant treatment or 
who have already had a long term course of these treatments. Initially, we were having only uh, we were seeing our patients, uh, the ones who were coming to the hospital in emergency department and at the uh, inpatient department. But now we have broadened our scope and we are doing telemedicine clinics uh, where we are reaching out to our patients who cannot come to us. We are following their symptoms and if they are they require. We book them in the for whatever uh, investigation they need. Uh, for those patients who are on adjuvant uh, hormonal therapy, we prescribe the hormonal therapy. If the patient lives nearby or can make it to the hospital, they can come and they can get their treatment from here from the pharmacy. But if the patient is unable to come here, we are sending the prescriptions out on WhatsApp or on their email IDs. Now recently when we uh, allowed uh, when we have started the walk in clinic services, uh, we are having once a week physical encounter with our patients in the clinic and this is for the newly diagnosed patients so that we can uh, see them. The patient's anxiety is allayed and we can uh, tell them the whole treatment plan and uh, address their queries there and then. However, with, during these physical interactions, we are using all the PPEs which are recommended during this treatment. So this is what we are doing at Shaka Khanam and I thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Hello. Hello. OK, 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 all right. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Um, can you all hear me? Um, I'm sure Anika can ring me if, if there is a problem. So I. Um, I'm sure all of you know me. Um, thanks to Dr. Neelam and Dr. Mazar uh, and um, uh, Kalsoom for uh, inviting me uh, on for this talk. I'm uh, Iktadar Mozam um, and I'm proud to be the first FCPS uh, from Shokat Khanam Hospital in internal medicine and first FCPS in medical oncology in this program. Sorry. Hello. G. Um, F5, F5, F5. G. I don't know why it is not working. F5.
assalamu alaikum um uh, i'm dr uh, mozam and uh, i will be uh, telling you about uh, our experience in east of england uh, how we have uh, coped with uh, breast cancer oncology during this covid-19 pandemic um and so this is map of england and scotland england wales uh, you most of you will know where i am but just to refresh your memories this is the area which we call east of england it's very small but very highly populated 1.4 million people uh, across different hospitals we have 50000 staff members a uh, very big budget and we have uh, different hospitals queens cancer center diana princess of wales uh, scarbra hospital scunthorpe uh, and hull royal infirmary and some some small district hospitals uh, in which we all provide oncology care these are my disclosures over last 3 years we know that the uh, corona virus uh, brought a lot of tra tragedies and uh, one of the most heartbreaking news was when we were we were told that dr tariq shafi who is a very renowned hematologist uh, very close to shaukat khanum hospital uh, i had the privilege to uh, discuss my cases with him and he was always very kind and uh, used to uh, give me very good advice he unfortunately uh, died after contracting corona virus but at the same time we we had uh, uh, some very successful stories uh, vakas elias one of our uh, doctors who uh, was like chief resident uh, so just like we have chief residents at shaukat khanum hospital he was on the same position in our cancer trust uh, very very hard working very reliable very knowledgeable a uh, very sweet human being he uh, got contracted uh, with corona virus he stayed on the ventilator for 5 weeks uh, he was unable to maintain his oxygenation so he was transferred to another center for um, ecmo which is extra corporeal corporeal membrane oxygenation uh, uh, therapy and uh, thankfully he recovered from there now he is went uh, he's off ventilator he's discharged and he is uh, coming back to his life when corona virus uh, uh, first arrived we were uh, we must admit that we were all completely unprepared we knew that this virus was quite close to uh, sars 1 and mars uh, mers virus the uh, the structure was quite common but the behavior appeared different with more patients developing low respiratory infections so in cancer patient uh, we were uh, in a big uh, dilemma what to do uh, the the first case report which came from china was just on 18 patients which indicated that uh, patients in general population if they develop corona virus infection they were at high risk of developing uh, uh, severe events which is icu admission uh, intubation and death and severe uh, and bad clinical course but if patients were cancer survivors that risk was exponentially increased and if they were uh, having active cancer or active cancer treatment the risk was even worse and uh, looking at the probability of severe events as compared to non cancer patients it was like 3 point uh, 3 and a half uh, times higher what to do with our chemotherapies with with this data so imperial college london actually gave us an estimate on risks of uh, corona virus related death and severe events so age was the main factor so these yellow bars you can see they indicate the risk of uh, increased fatality with corona virus and with age with increasing age the risk has increased but if on the top of it patient had cancer then the risk had increased many folds so uh, during all this um, nhs england actually gave uh, some guidance which was uh, very much the same as dr neelam has uh, already mentioned um, 
and Kalsum and uh, Dr. Mazar, they have actually explained how they are implemented at Shokat Khanam Cancer Hospital. Uh, but area of uncertainty both among physicians and uh, patients continued. So, so we 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 had a lot of questions, a lot of unanswered questions, which remained unanswered for a very long time. What to advise our patients uh, if there are complications related to if, if patient presents, whether it is a complication of cancer or it is COVID, uh, which patients to isolate, uh, which patients to test, what should be the level of escalation if our cancer patients progress or deteriorate? And if patients undergo cardiac arrest, whether who to perform CPR, uh, which advanced cancer patient would be candidate for intubation and ventilation. If patient uh, deteriorate and they are for end of life care, whether to advise family uh, to visit their patients. Once patient recover, when to restart treatment, uh, what to document on death certificates if patients dies. So these were all patient issues, but staff had their own dilemma. Uh, personal protective, protective equipment, PPEs, they were not available in the beginning. And uh, when they go back home, they have their family life and their children, how to protect them. And with uh, more staff members becoming corona positive, symptomatic or asymptomatic, they had to go to for isolation. So how to cope with all this patient burden and workload? Uh, so this is important to to know what was our experience and I will be telling you about our uh, patients with breast cancer, how we have done with them. And this is important because um, if you look at the uh, graph of new cases in United Kingdom, uh, it already has uh, achieved its peak. Uh, there is flattening of curve and now curve is going down. And same is the case with mortality. On the other hand, if we look at WHO data from Pakistan, uh, Pakistan has not reached its peak as yet. And I feel that uh, today Pakistan is in the same position as United Kingdom was on 23rd of April. So, so nearly two months ago or six, six weeks ago. So Pakistan is probably six weeks behind what United Kingdom was at that time. So for this talk, what I have done is I have a retrospective uh, in a retrospective manner. I have reviewed hospital record of patients admitted with COVID-19 infection. Uh, I have included patients for my data presentation uh, patients who had breast cancer and who were COVID-19 positive by uh, RT-PCR, either done on nasopharyngeal swab or in sputum. And I have excluded breast cancer patients who had low suspicion of COVID-19 and they were negative for RT-PCR. This is a big limitation because we know that in 2 to 19% of patients, first swab uh, could be negative. And we have seen in multiple patients in whom suspicion was high. So we had done multiple swabs and they were negative and eventually they had a sputum test which came positive. And what I have done is I have compared patient characteristics and outcome with large data set from China and United States. So um, in total, there were six breast cancer patients uh, which were found to have coronavirus uh, positive test uh, uh, positive. Five had a positive RT-PCR. One had negative, but radiologic findings were very, very convincing for coronavirus and that data was collected over last six weeks period. So uh, in this table of baseline characteristics of patients, I have compared data from uh, China, which was the first report uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine, more than 1000 patients. And remember, this is general population with less than 1% of patients having diagnosis of cancer. Then I looked at data from USA, New York data, which came uh, later, uh, nearly 400 patients, but again, cancer patients were only 6%. And this is our East of England data, all uh, cancer patients with breast cancer and COVID infection. 
obviously the number uh, are nowhere to compare but i would like you to concentrate on the percentage here so just give us an idea how our breast cancer patients when they develop covid positive can be a little bit different from general population so mean age uh, usually breast cancer patients are uh, uh, in between uh, the, the usual mean of uh, general population uh, you in 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 general population most patients are male but obviously here all patients were female patients in china uh, 40 percent of patients had fever at the time of admission but once they were admitted uh, almost all of them had the temperature and cough was the second major presentation in united states patients were febrile from the time of admission but uh, more than half of the patients also had shortness of breath but this this data is is really staggering here you can see that uh, in china only four percent of patient had diarrhea or gi problems uh, at the time of admission or during hospitalization in contrast to usa where about one in four patients had gi problems and this is when we started to know that the patients with covid can have uh, gi problems as well in our data set, uh, the main presentation was uh, fever uh, at the time of admission or hospitalization in 50% of patient, 17% had dyspnea, uh, some patient have just flu-like symptoms, um, and uh, there was variable trend in terms of comorbid conditions. In terms of radiologic findings, um, ground glass opacity, especially in the periphery, Peripheral ground glass opacity, which are usually very, very rounded, very, very well defined. They are hallmark of uh, COVID-19 infection. Uh, on chest X-ray, we just see uh, infiltrates. Uh, so the uh, usual pattern is central uh, zones are negative and there are infiltrates at the periphery. Pleural effusion, presence of pleural effusion is highly unlikely. Pleural effusion, cavitation, uh, central infiltrates are very unlikely, especially in the early stages of COVID-19. So um, in China, as expected, ground glass opacities were the was the most common finding, and so was that in the United States. In our cancer patients, we had mixed findings. So patients had finding because of uh, COVID-19. So ground glass opacity in about 50% of patients, uh, but some patients have lymphangitis because of their cancer and presence of pleural effusion. Most remarkable finding was presence of lymphopenia. So majority of the patients in China and in USA had lymphopenia, but in our population, all patients had lymphopenia. So that is very, very remarkable because in cancer patients, we tend to follow blood counts quite regularly. And if you look at their trend, they were always lymphocytic. So there will be episodes of neutropenia, but mostly lymphocytes were normal or near normal. And then there was uh, a sudden drop in lymphocyte count without any explanation. That is coronavirus. In terms of uh, neutrophil count, so in our six patients of population, uh, uh, neutrophil counts were between 0 0.17 to 4.97. Uh, high CRP level is also indicative of uh, bad disease. All of our patients had high CRP. That could be cancer, that could be treatment, that could be coronavirus. Uh, septic shock, ARDS, acute kidney injury, DIC, and rhabdomyolysis. These are were the most common complications uh, which were seen in China and in New York. Uh, in, in our cohort of patient, uh, uh, they, they, one of the patient had septic shock, ARDS, and acute kidney injury. All of them in just one patient. The remaining four and five patients were all right. In terms of discharge from hospital, uh, in our uh, data set, 75% of patients were discharged, which was better than the the general population uh, seen in in the trend seen in United States and in China. Um, 
death rate was 10 percent in new york 1.4 percent in china and in our one out of six patients uh, died mean hospital stay was seven days uh, so range was between four to ten um if we have time i can quickly go through four oncology patients who were on systemic treatment and got admitted so i will be uh, real quick so the first patient was 54 years old female with relapsed metastatic breast cancer er positive her to negative disease was widespread lung liver pleura, pleura peritoneum and bone metastasis multiple lines of chemotherapies and endocrine therapies including palbociclib and denosumab now this patient was on capecitabine cycle 5 day 18 presented with dyspnea due to pleural effusion uh, admitted for pleural drainage this patient had successful drainage became symptom free and was discharged after nine days she was offered treatment according to recovery trial uh, in which we were giving uh, hydrochloroquine azithromycin high dose steroids to patients uh, but she declined uh, she is uh, four weeks post discharge still alive and her oncologist have not started her own treatment Next patient is 72 years old female. This was an early breast cancer uh, and triple receptor negative. Small tumor, node negative. In these patients, especially if they are triple negative, we tend to use combination of anthracycline and thexanes. For, for this patient, what we did was we, we, we just use EC. Uh, according to our protocol, we are avoiding thexane in our hospital because of either frequent visit or high risk of neutropenia. Uh, she was admitted on cycle 4, day 12 of adjuvant EC90 with suspected neutropenic sepsis, treated successfully for neutropenia and discharge in 10 days. Uh, we are in abbreviated treatment. Instead of six, we are giving four cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy in most patients. So she already had completed her chemotherapy and then she had abbreviated course of radiation therapy uh, which is 26 grain five fraction as Dr. Mazar have uh, uh, shown, uh, have, have actually mentioned that it has been shown equivalent and safe in um, fast forward trial. Uh, and that is the standard of care now during COVID-19 for all of our patients. Uh, the third one was 57 years old, relapsed metastatic breast cancer patient. Uh, she was ER positive, HER2 negative. Uh, but with peritoneal and bone metastasis. She was started on paclitaxel, but because uh, of her peritoneal mets admitted with bowel obstructions. So I changed her treatment to full strength with the plan of adding ribociclib uh, once COVID-19 risks were low. She was admitted on cycle two, day three uh, of palliative uh, full strength with chest pain, paraparesis, and found to have metastatic spinal cord compression. This patient had uh, a super fast course. So while we were managing her spinal cord compression, she developed uh, acute onset of acute kidney injury, lost her conscious level and developed septic shock. She died within five days of uh, admission. Uh, she was given full supportive care in the beginning, but she had no response. So she was put on end of life care in last three days of her life. Third one was 56 years old female, early breast cancer. She was uh, again um, ER positive, HER2 negative. Uh, she had breast conserving surgery, completed three cycles of FEC. We, we, we are not mostly using FEC. This patient was an outlier. Uh, with four cycles of docetaxel, uh, she had uh, an allergic reaction. So fifth cycle was delayed. And on cycle five, day 28, she was admitted with neutropenic sepsis. Her counts recovered very, very quickly. And within four days, she was discharged. Uh, for all our patients uh, on adjuvant and new adjuvant, as well as metastatic setting, we are using NAP paclitaxel instead of uh, docetaxel and weekly paclitaxel with uh, less risk of hospital exposure and less risk of uh, neutropenia. Uh, we, we use napaclitaxel on three weekly dose. Quickly about a couple of patients who had uh, surgery. So one was 53 years old female uh, worker in a 
in the respiratory ward. She developed flu-like symptoms and was found to be COVID positive. At the same time, she was diagnosed with the ER positive and HER2 positive breast cancer. Usually, we recommend uh, uh, new adjuvant treatment chemotherapy with pertuzumab and trastuzumab uh, in uh, high risk HER2 positive patient, but uh, this patient was not offered chemotherapy. Instead, she went for direct for mastectomy and axillary dissection due to a uh, risk that our operation theaters uh, will become short. We, we what we did was we stopped new adjuvant chemotherapy for a lot of patients and sent them for surgery. Um, that strategy was good because at some point we were told that our operation rooms are no more available. So those patients actually continued with their new adjuvant therapy. For this patient, she had to wait for nearly 50 days before from diagnosis before she had her operation. Postoperatively, my plan is to give her um, pertuzumab, her septin with napaclitaxel if she is not positive, otherwise just napaclitaxel and uh, uh, um, trastuzumab and short course of radiation therapy plus endocrine treatment as uh, usual protocol. The second case was 50 years old female. She had cerebral palsy, so a lot of problems in decision making and looking after herself. She was a resident of nursing home where one of the resident was found COVID positive and later she developed fever and cough. But at the same time, she also developed a breast lump, which was uh, because of very high risk T3 N2 triple receptor negative breast cancer. Um, again, because of uh, our ongoing uh, changes in pathways, she was not offered platinum based new adjuvant chemotherapy. Instead, she had mastectomy and axillary node dissection, but it took about 50 days for her to reach to surgical theater. Um, she has very high risk disease, but we are not offering her adjuvant treatment because of her personal and medical problems. Uh, this this is this is uh, um, very fresh in the press. If you have not seen it, uh, just published last week. Uh, this is a big data set of 200 patients uh, from China. Um, majority of them had solid tumor. Few of them had hematologic toxicity. 20% had breast cancer, and in breast cancer. A majority out of 40 patients, 37 were survivors and three patients died from COVID-19 infection. Um, my interest was to see what happened to patients who received chemotherapy uh, and anti-cancer treatment in last four weeks before symptom onset of COVID-19. So um, patients who survived, only 11% of them had uh, chemotherapy. Uh, while 44% of patients had chemotherapy in last four weeks and they succumbed to, to their disease. Uh, majority of patients who survived were as expected of early stage. Uh, patients who died were half of them were from early stage and half of them were from advanced stage. In their multivariant analysis, uh, having male sex and receiving chemotherapy within last four weeks of uh, 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 four weeks before symptom development uh, were putting patients at high risk of death. Thank you very much uh, for listening to my talk. Um, I would say that my message and conclusion is we have to uh, stay safe and well and keep our patients safe and well. Uh, be strong and sensible and cautious here and be smiling. And this is the uh, Shaukat Khanam group, which is working with me at Hull. Uh, Dr. Vakas Ali, uh, Dr. Khaliqur Rahman, these are both uh, clinical oncologists. It's me, Dr. Neelam, when uh, she was kind enough to visit us for her uh, talk in our breast cancer symposium. Dr. Shah, he is a medical oncologist and Dr. Butt, who is our lead in medical oncology. Thank you very much.
Okay, so can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can hear you. It would be nice if you could stay. Uh, this one. Uh, so uh, I've had a couple of questions people have asked. So I thought I'll just. Uh, I think you're too close to mask. Maybe keep it off. So somebody has asked, uh, uh, they haven't given a name, that how to plan for breast cancer surgery. So I can tell you what like we, we've done here, but we're going to have a webinar on breast cancer surgery in the third week. So I would you know, like uh, strongly recommend that uh, whoever has asked the question can maybe repeat that. But Obviously, when the uh, pandemic started, everybody was, you know, like we weren't sure what we we're doing. So, main uh, issue is really theater space, and we needed to have the ventilators and everything reserved for the COVID patients. And uh, so we, you know, like elective surgery was every was put on hold, and uh, most of the patients. Uh, were started on their new adjuvant chemotherapies or endocrine therapies, and then we went to surgery later on. And uh, those patients who were already started, we completed chemo their therapy, and then uh, the, so by that time, you know, like after about four to six weeks, we just presented. Uh, I think things started getting streamlined, and then obviously surgeons can't stay without operating, and you know, and there was a backlog. So they started doing the surgeries, but we wanted that not to occupy beds. So they really, I think, I don't know how they managed, but they started doing day surgery. So patients are having breast surgery and then they go home the same day, same night, and maximum maybe the next day. I think that has been, that has, you know, like made them able to do it. But I would like to hear from Iqtadar. You just said that you, you know, like you started, did surgery upfront for most of the patients and then yes. sent them exactly. for, so what was exactly. the sort of so, experience? So, uh, was, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so the, the breast surgical society in United Kingdom, actually that gave a guideline that uh, patients should not be offered new adjuvant chemotherapy if breast conservation or downstaging is the uh, aim. So all patients who were getting new adjuvant chemotherapy for those aims, uh, we stopped their new adjuvant chemotherapy or did not offer new adjuvant chemotherapy, except inflammatory breast cancer or patients uh, who had very heavy burden of disease and sent them straight for surgery. And uh, again in surgery, because a lot of patients were moved to surgery, uh, there was a big backlog. So what surgeons did was that usually we, we tend to operate patients within four, within three to six weeks of end of chemotherapy or presentation. But here we increase that duration uh, waiting time to six to eight weeks. And some of the patients who were delayed a little bit more than that, they were started on new adjuvant endocrine treatment if they were hormone receptor positive. Uh, the two patients which I have uh, uh, mentioned, both of these patients uh, had to have their COVID test negative before they uh, underwent their surgery. Um, most of the patients actually who were COVID positive, they waited for them to get better. And during that time, if possible, they were started on new adjuvant endocrine treatment with very close uh, follow up. So I think that sort of answers the question for surgery. Then there's another question. Uh, this is from Dr. Adil Nazir. Uh, he's been our fellow here at SKM and now he's at uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Riyadh. So I'm really excited to know that we've got international audience. Well, well we had an international speaker. So uh, Dr. Adil has asked that, you know, like for metastatic breast cancer, that uh, he's asked me that have you considered stopping uh, chemotherapy for uh, some patients because they know that I'm one of those oncologists that you know, like that try to keep on treating the patients uh, right to the end. 
chemotherapy so you know cape cyclobine works quite well and first cycle uh, we after one week i give them a small dose 3 plus 3 see them in the teleclinic if it not an issue then give the second week then there's one week gap and then depending on the tolerance you know like build up the dose it works well for quite a lot of patients but you know that it depends on the biology of the tumor and any other characteristics if uh, uh, you're not able to give oral or if it's a visceral crisis then obviously intravenous chemotherapy you have to give again depending if you are uh, if a patient has had a positive disease you can give a combination of uh, aspirin bitumen and venerolabin uh, which is uh, quite well tolerated and there is a valid study on elderly patients as well if it's an endocrine positive then it's easier you know that you can go on so for chemotherapy stopping is that if somebody has had multiple lines of chemotherapy already and now that patient comes in with progressive disease yes then i think twice that you know like giving the patient chemotherapy again getting her neutropenic gcsr and you know if she lands in the er with febrile neutropenia Our ER is already overwhelmed. The wards are full, so yes. Then after discussing with the patient, and if I feel that it's not going to benefit her much, then I do put chemotherapy on hold and offer supportive therapy. And uh, just to add, mm-hmm. yeah, 